Welcome to St. Andrew's Lunchtime Service. If we haven't met, my name is Nathan. I'm the assistant to the minister here, uh, standing in for Reverend David and um, recently because of the um, stepping down of Reverend Robert Wilson. So I'll be here perhaps a little bit more often. So thanks for having me. The psalmist says that, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. How pleasant. So let us come together and worship God. from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly host praise Father, Son and Holy Holy God, loving Father, you gather us to worship you today. And today we thank you and adore you for your goodness. We thank you for how you reveal that you are the fountainhead of all blessings. That you not only blessed the whole creation through the wonders and beauty of your creativity, You also reveal your goodness in and through the particular suffering of your own son. And it is through bearing the consequences of sin and evil all upon himself. And through that, and by the resurrection, you have shown us that good will triumph. And good has triumphed. In a world full of injustice and oppression, and even as in our individual lives we may be facing our particular challenges, we confess the weakness of our faith, even our doubt in your goodness in this moment of silence. One John one nine says that we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And in the spirit of what Jesus says to to Thomas, to invite Thomas to test and reach out and touch his sides and put his fingers through his nail prints. Let us continue to worship in peace and live in unity and in trust of goodness of God's kingdom. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, within the um, <clears throat> bulletin this week, I'd like to just highlight uh, the, the uh, upcoming uh, the event about mission at the end of this month, which is only, I think, three weeks away. 
It's on the Saturday of 26th of October. It has, is not yet listed here, but um, this year the mission action group would like to engage the whole congregation, different parts of the congregation and St. Andrew community to not just attend it, but perhaps get involved to help out in some ways. Uh, I'm sure more details will follow after they meet to plan further this coming Sunday. So next week, uh, you have more details, perhaps how you might want to contribute to that event. So that is not yet listed on here, but I'd just like to give you a heads up. And for the rest, I'll leave you to read. And now we come to the reading of the word. Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is part of the sermon series that we've been preaching and has concluded for the 90th anniversary celebration this year. But I, it has not been preached in this congregation, so I'd like to share that with you uh, and have summarized it. When we say the common good or the greater good today, we usually mean the welfare of society or the welfare of the general public. And that, is, that was also what the term meant in Greek thought that preceded the writing of what we have just read. However, that's not what the Apostle Paul meant in his letters to the Corinthians. It's crucial to understand Paul's meaning of the common good because the term has been thrown around so much these days, has become a convenient soundbite for virtue signaling, even among Christians. It's for the greater good. It's for the common good. But there's nothing common about the common good anymore. The misapplication of the term common good or the greater good has often led to and entrenched conflicts and even wars. It's been said that the worst wars aren't those fought between good and evil, but between good and good. That is because what seems good to one group might seem evil <laughs> to another what one group celebrates as utopia might be another's dystopia. One group's best dream could easily be another's worst nightmare. So each side fights to defend its version of good in the name of good. And that's what we see today. A deeply divided world with different views on what is good. And among these, is a popular narrative that says the common good is achievable without a common God or religion. In fact, many argue that the common good is better achieved when we get rid of all religions. People point to violence and oppression, atrocity, holy wars carried out in the name of, religion, of God as evidence for this. And this perspective has led to statements like 
what you or your God think is good for everyone is not good for me. What you claim as good for all is not good for, not, at least not for me or my group or my people or my community. On any given issue, people hold different opinions and views about what is good. And it has become so difficult, if not impossible, to agree on what constitutes good. And we often don't get along, even within the church, because of that. And therefore, society has fractured like a shattered mirror into countless pieces of sects, silos, and subgroups. In other words, as I said before, there's nothing common about the common good. And therefore, it's vital to understand Paul's meaning of the common good here, especially if we want to be Christians who do good in the church and in the society. So, what did Paul mean? Well, Paul was first talking about, or first thing talking about, talk, talking to the church, the Christian community at Corinth but not about a variety of views or opinions on what is good, but on the variety of gifts, spiritual gifts, talents. He explained that these gifts exist to serve the good of the overall church body, and he pointed out the source of those gifts. There, there are various kinds of gifts, services, and activities. But they are not self-produced or artificial. Instead, they all come from the same common source who bestows these gifts freely and generously. And Paul began by highlighting that there's nothing uncommon there's something uncommon, something peculiar and strange about that source. Verse 6 says, this variety of gifts is the manifestation of the Spirit, and that Spirit is not just any other Spirit, as in mystical entities or ideologies or principles. It's the Holy Spirit, a unique Spirit set apart from all other spirits. And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes something highly specific possible. And that is the ability to confess that Jesus is Lord. Even when one is under great trials and tribulations. And this confession is, again, not common at all. It's very specific. Paul saw this firsthand. He finally recognized this firsthand when he, saw, when he was still Saul. By the same Spirit, while he was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians, his eyes were finally opened to realize and identify that this Jesus of Nazareth is actually the God of the Hebrew Bible, the tradition Saul was so zealous about that he was ready to kill and persecute. So here, Paul is saying that there's a multiplicity of gifts, but a, single, a singularity within that source or origin of those gifts. And they all come from the same Spirit, the same Lord Jesus Christ and the same God, the Father. So while the term the Trinity isn't used here, the meaning is clear. In other words, when Paul speaks of the common good, he's not first of all, talking about the societal welfare in a general sense that we can achieve by working together. But to the welfare of the church, rooted in the specific confession in the Holy Trinity. The common good has a highly uncommon holy source. 
So how do we apply this in an age where there's nothing common in a common good? We must recognize that the secular desire for a diverse yet united society originally comes from and ultimately finds the fulfillment in a trinity. That's the root, the fountainhead. And the church, the body of believers, is meant to be an uncommon but attractive social phenomena, a contrast community to the surrounding cultures. And these cultures, we have been struggling and failing to achieve the common good, are meant to see through the church like through these stained glass windows, broken, shattered, but put back together, to see the goodness and reality and beauty of that uncommon source, which is the Holy Trinity. We often think of being part of God's mission or evangelism or uh, discipleship is you know, just to go out and preach and do social welfare stuff or to engage, you know, talk, join a Bible study and talk about theological questions, and that's it. But in light of all this, being part of God's mission and evangelism as a disciple of Christ also means discovering your gifts and honing, honing in on them in service of others and serving alongside others whose gifts and talents are totally different from yours. Which means you're part of an all-star team and you have a very specific gifts and talents in your specific area while others have theirs. And as we do that, in that process, we make every effort to live out our unity within that God-given diversity of talents and gifts. That is the key expression of faith in this time. When the church embodies that unity with diversity of gifts, it will be a beacon of hope to a desperate world, a world that is struggling to achieve this common good despite all the great talents and achievements that we have seen. And yet, we can build devices like smartphones with more technologies that can, uh, comparing to what sent us to the moon. But now, we don't seem to be able to even talk face to face with one another. But sadly, this division is not just out there in society, but also among Christians. And our disunity have weakened our witness to the world. We argue and divide over issues that shouldn't really divide us. We've forgotten how to agree to disagree on issues like social justice, on politics, on how we do church, how we make decisions in the church body, the style of worship, uh, where we are supposed to put these flowers, <laughs> you name it. We can be so easily divided on so many issues that shouldn't have divided us. And that has prevented us to form a united front in this secular world. Now, if, you, we truly, if we truly want to serve the common good, we must reconcile with one another. We must make peace regardless of our personal, cultural, or even denominational differences. We must humble ourselves and admit that we don't fully know what is good. We must work together for the good of the church and society. But why don't we? Because, well, for, for one, giftedness, often leads to pride. That's obvious. And facing and admitting one's limited knowledge can be frightening. 
sometimes the hardest thing is to say, I don't know. <laughs> it seems to me the church are like this. What hope is there for the common good, the real common good for the greater society? Well, remember this. This is good news. Remember how the triumph of the common good has been revealed in the most uncommon, peculiar evil, the cross of Christ. Unlike all leaders who sacrifice others for the sake of the greater good, Jesus Christ sacrificed himself. He became the ultimate minority, the ultimate outcast, the victim of all systemic injustices that you can think of. He didn't get a fair trial. All his followers betrayed and deserted him in the final moment. But through his death on the cross, he was raised by God the Father to show the ultimate victory of good over evil. He assures us that common good rooted in the triune God will ultimately prevail. And that is not just an ideology, a political or moralistic soundbite. It's something that he put his own life on the line to show. And it is also what the early church has put their lives on the line and suffered through persecution to preserve this precious witness. And when we see that, and we pick up the call to pick up the cross to follow Christ and endure suffering that is uh, less vi physically violent but no less real in, our, in the Western part of society comparing to other parts of the world. When we see that, when we embrace this call, we can be, a we can be secured by the resurrection. And it keeps us humble even when we are gifted we can admit that we don't know, but still have the confidence about the future. We can let go of our need to control or to be seen to know better. Then and only then will we be able to define, stop defining what good is in our own terms and to let go of our need or right to control or, or to, uh, and we'll be able to reconcile and reunite with one another despite our differences. Then and only then we'll be able to start to truly serve others, the common good, first within a church and then in society. Let us respond and um, recite this together to strengthen our faith, the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will revive your church and bring about a greater and true unity in the midst of all the rich diversity you have bestowed upon, up, upon us. We pray for this unity and diversity to become a compelling witness to the society outside. And we pray that for Christians, 
brothers and brothers sisters who work in public affairs and in the government, in all sectors of a society, might be able to have this strange but attractive character. We pray for the upcoming election, ACT election, on the 19th of October, in a few weeks' time. We pray that Christians can hold different political views, <clears throat> support different candidates, but still ground ourselves in the bedrock of the unity that we have in you, Jesus Christ. Restoring us the ability to talk peacefully, disagree amicably, and reason with a sharp mind and a soft, gentle heart. We even remember the, the other elections around the world. The biggest one probably is the upcoming U.S. election. We pray as spectator uh, that this election will, will not cause further divisions of polarization in the U.S. or the greater world. Uh, we also pray that as Australian citizens here, we observe from afar and learn some lessons of what's been going on in that part of the world. We also pray for the upcoming missionary, uh, the Mission Action Group fundraising dinner at the end of this month. We pray that all members, all parts of the church might come together to serve with their respective gifts and talents and contributions. And as a whole, as we serve together with our best and in humility, uh, we realize just a bit more of that contrast community that you have called us to be. Lord, we can't do this on our own, but trust that by your power, and your renewing grace, you will revive and renew your church. Even our, our own hearts, you can soften and bring us closer. And together we pray you will strengthen all your people in Canberra, all your Christians in Canberra, to be ready to be united to face the various forms of persecution, obvious or covert, and still be able to love. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we close with the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that He has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass us against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. sweeping through us revive your church with life and power oh breath of life come cleanse renew us and fit your church to meet this hour oh wind of God come bend and break us 
to humbly we confess our need then in your tenderness remake us revive restore for this replete O breath of love come breathe within us renewing thought and will and heart come love of Christ afresh to win us revive your church in every part may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit be with you all